I'll share with us out of Proverbs this morning. It's Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thy own understanding. What a verse that is, is applicable for us today. Trust the Lord no matter what we're facing. Deborah, it's good to see you here today. God, God brought you through. We pray for future procedures you got to have. And others, you got to trust the Lord no matter what may come your way. Do not lean to our own understanding. How hard is that? Especially for men in this room and listening. For us not to trust in the Lord, but to trust, uh, not to trust in ourselves, but to trust in the Lord. So this morning, I just challenge us all to take those verses as we walk this week, as we hear from our pastor today as he brings our message, as we worship, trust in the Lord what he's telling you, because if you're his child, he's speaking to you. If you are listening today and you're not his child, he's calling you with the gospel of his, set, of his son, calling you to be saved today. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning, church family. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord today and those who are joining us live. We uh, thank you and uh, as we join our hearts in worship, let's stand and sing Hosanna, praise is rising. Oh 
Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us. Father, as I look out this morning and see quite a few people here today, Father, it just does my heart good, Father. Father, I just know in this day that we live in, it, things are different. Things are different today, they'll be tomorrow. But Father, you are faithful. And we just trust you, Father, as you said in your word, Father, to be about the work that you've given us to do, and that's to spread the gospel across this world. Father, I just pray for our, our membership. I pray for those that are listening today or watching on Facebook. Father, I know that there's many, many people that are confined. I went and visited one yesterday afternoon, Father. He, he would love to be back in your house, Father, but he's just scared, Father, because of this, this virus, Father. And Father, it is something to be respected, but Father, we know that you are in control of all things and we depend on you, Father. And we just look for the days ahead, Father, what you'll make good out of all this that's happened. Father, we are, thank you for loving us. We thank you for our church family. And Father, we just look forward to the day, Father, when we have a house full. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs>
Dear Father, I pray for our nation. I pray that you will restore us to you, dear Father, as a nation as a whole draws back to you, dear Father. Dear Father, uh, be with the message this morning and the lost people that hear this message, dear Father, I pray that they'll be drawn to you so that they too will have our promise of heaven one day. I pray for the offering, dear Father, that it will be used to further serve your kingdom and just be with us, dear Father. And again, thank you for all you do for us. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you, Lord. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open them to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Uh, last week, we began uh, a series, the Left Behind series, and we looked at when all restraint is gone, as the restraining starts to erode away. Um, today, we're looking at a world with no restraint. What the world will be like when the restraining power of the Holy Spirit against the spirit of Antichrist is gone. The Bible gives us a good in indication and, and lets us know that we are not to be ignorant concerning uh, the return of Jesus Christ to this earth and what the situation on the earth will be like when the Lord Jesus Christ does return. Now, you know the return of Christ is two phases. First, He comes for the church. We refer to that as the rapture most of the time. Second, part of His second coming will be at the end of the tribulation where He will ride forth from heaven with the armies of heaven following behind Him to fight the battle of Armageddon, judge the nations, and then set up and rule and reign upon this earth from the throne of His father David for 1,000 years. Now, we are living in a world that's rapidly moving toward the coming of Jesus Christ uh, for the church in the first phase of the second coming. And the Bible has taught us that in the last days of church age, there would be a great falling away, sometimes referred to as the age of apostasy. The word apostasy means falling away. It's also... Uh, the, the time of the Laodicean church age, seven representative letters were given to John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The final of those seven letters was the letter to the church of the Laodiceans. It's the church where Jesus is no longer the sinner, but rather he's on the outside knocking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, the Lord says, in that final letter. In the small little book of Jude, we're given descriptive terminologies of what an apostate, someone who has fallen away from the faith, will look like. Jude, the book of Jude describes an apostate as a hidden rock. And that gives an understanding from the Greek of a, of a, of a reef in the ocean. Uh, that a ship would uh, come upon and become shipwrecked. I used to go down uh, when I worked uh, in the secular world before I came into ministry and uh, to go to the second longest barrier reef in the world down in Belize. And there were some ships that had gotten on that reef because they couldn't see it and they became shipwrecked. And they're stranded and they couldn't go forward or backward. And that's what uh, an apostate is is described as by in the book of Jude someone a, a hidden rock or a reef that will cause someone to be shipwrecked. Jude also describes uh, an apostate as a cloud without water. The main function of clouds is to bring much needed water, uh, much needed rain to the earth. A cloud without water, the only thing it's good for is to block out the sun. That's what so many apostates are doing. They're blocking people from seeing the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our only hope and our only means of salvation. Jude also describes, the book of Jude describes an apostate as a tree without fruit. Trees without fruit. We remember that the Lord Jesus Christ cursed the fig tree and it withered and died because it bore no fruit. Paul says in Romans 22 that in describing our salvation, but now being set free from sin, you become servants unto God and have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And so uh, an apostate is a, is, a, is a tree without fruit and all that a tree without fruit is good for is to be cut down and cast into the fire for firewood. And he also describes, the book of Jude also describes 
an apostate as a wandering star. You and I would understand that to be a shooting star, a small little asteroid or a meteor that comes into our uh, atmosphere and it burns up on entry. On entry, it will it will burn bright for a moment, and then it fizzes right out. And that's what we have so many of the stars in the world which you and I live in. They burn bright for a moment, but there's no substance to them from the true light of God, and they fizz out and flame out. And so many of the world today are following these stars, these fizzing out things that. Uh, they're, they're taking them into perdition. So the age of apostasy is the falling away. And the Bible gives us, as the church, some definite and distinctive things that we are to watch for to know where we are on God's prophetic timetable. And one of those, without a doubt, is the nation of Israel. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, 24th chapter, we are to learn the parable of the fig tree. That was the nation of Israel when they had come back into the land. When they put forth their leaves and that has taken place. Israel, after 1800 plus years of being dispersed throughout the world, have gathered back into the land of Palestine and they are, they are now uh, in the land that God gave them. We're also to watch for the rise of Russia and the Muslim confederate nations that will join with Russia and come and attack Israel that the prophet Ezekiel prophesied about 2650 some odd years ago and we're seeing the convergence of these nations coming together and we understand and know the conflict that's there in the Middle East and all the things that are taking place there and we're to watch for that. We're also to watch for the rise of China. The Bible tells us in the time of the tribulation that the kings of the east, which will include China, will send an army of 200 million men into the Middle East to, to prepare for the battle of Armageddon. So we see the emergence and the rising of China in the world that you and I are a part of. We're also to watch for the revived Roman Empire. Four great Gentile world powers were predicted in the book of Daniel in chapter 2, in chapter 7. The final fourth world power was the Roman Empire. And it was prophesied that it would come in two stages, that it was a divided kingdom. We've seen the first stage come and go. And there's never been nothing on this earth like the Roman Empire. Now we're waiting for the emergence of that revived Roman Empire because we know and understand from the prophetic word that it will be the kingdom from which the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, the seed of the serpent will come from. We understand today that we see the formulation of that in uh, the European Union of the day and age that you and I live here upon the earth. And we're also to watch for what Jesus Christ described as the signs of the times, the birth pains uh, that would come. He said, don't be deceived. We know deception will, will, will run rampant. And he spoke of wars and rumors of wars. He spoke of earthquakes and natural disasters and pestilences. And we're seeing that in the world in which you and I live all around us. And all of these things will lead up to the point of the rapture of the church where God takes His church out, where Jesus Christ will step forth from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel will sound and the trumpet of God will blare forth and the dead who are in Christ will raise, will come uh, be resurrected from their tombs and we who are alive and remain will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we'll meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. Jesus described this in Matthew's Gospel. He said two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Last week I had a question for you. Will you be part 
of the falling away? Will you be part of the age of apostasy where you will forsake God's church here upon the earth? I don't want to be part of the Laodicean church. I don't want to be a part of the falling away. Question for you today. Will you be left behind? Two will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. In Luke's gospel, it says two will be sleeping in the bed. One will be taken, the other left. We're looking at a world with no restraint once the church is raptured out. Read with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning again with verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that it is that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he, that would be the man of sin, may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, but they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, Thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we have this day to gather here in your house. And for those who are gathering with us via radio or Facebook, we pray now that as we've opened up your word, you would speak to our hearts in a mighty way. We pray that the power and presence of your Holy Spirit will be great in our midst. I pray, Father, that you will use me to speak forth your truth in great clarity under the unction and guidance of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, for each one listening to have open hearts and receptive ears. I pray your Holy Spirit would take your word and cause it to become alive and living in each and every heart and each and every life that your word may accomplish its purpose, that we may do your will. We live in very difficult days, Father. We live in troublesome times. We ask for your hedge of protection around us. We ask for your sustaining grace to be given to us. We do intercede for our nation. We see it unraveling right before our eyes. Help us in these last days to 
to be the church you've called us to be, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Help us to work while the day is still here because the night is coming when we can work no more. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you now for what you're going to do. Thank you most of all for Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. What do you think it's going to be like on the earth when God removes his church? When there's not one saved person left on this planet? When the salt that preserves is gone? When the light that dispels darkness is gone? When the Holy Spirit is no longer resisting the spirit of Antichrist, it'll be a world with no restraint. It'll be a world of total chaos. It'll be a world of darkness. It'll be a world ripe for the coming of this lawless one, this man of iniquity, this son of perdition that the Bible has prophesied about. We're seeing the falling away taking place right before our eyes. We're seeing all the pertinent prophetic scriptures that God has given us that would be in place when His Son returns. We're seeing that all right before our very eyes. And if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, I think you'll have a dread in your heart of what's not just coming upon our nation that's coming upon the whole world. And I think it should give us an intensity. It should give us a desire to see how many we can reach for the gospel before it's everlastingly too late. In this passage, Paul says, he who restrains, this is a reference to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that God gave to us after Jesus Christ departed uh, from this earth. He gave us the Holy Spirit as the comforter. He said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. And we know that the Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin and to, and, to, and to let people know of their great need through conviction of salvation that can only come through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit came to lift up Jesus Christ and then for those who will accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is sealed in us as our down payment, as our earnest of the great salvation that we experience in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's there to guide us and lead us into the paths of righteousness. He's to, pre to, to take out the predestination and conform us to the image of Christ that we are seeing happen as the work of salvation begins in us, uh, in our salvation. But the Holy Spirit is also working through the church to suppress the spirit of Antichrist. I've, made, I've mentioned this to you time and time again. This world has no clue the function of the church and the good that this church is doing for this world today. We are suppressing the spirit of Antichrist. But as the falling away comes, as there are fewer and fewer in the church to function in the great role that God has given us as the salt of the earth to preserve it and as the light of the world to dispel darkness, as the falling away comes, the light gets dim, the salt begins to lose its savor, and we are no longer will be able to see the Spirit of God working in as strong a way as it once was to suppress the spirit of Antichrist. You say, what happens when the spirit of Antichrist is not suppressed? That's what we're looking at today. A world with no restraint. You and I, we have a great role in this earth. You and I, we have the greatest of needs to, to bring the wonderful truth of the gospel message to this earth. To let the people know of this earth that God loved them with an everlasting love. 
that he desires to have a relationship with them and to give them forgiveness of their sin and cause them to be born spiritually, born from above, and one day take them out of here and take them to the wonderful place of heaven that we will spend eternity in. We have the greatest message on the earth. We have the greatest role on the earth. And we need to be functioning as God has called us to in these last days. Because there's coming a time when all the strength will be gone. And Satan will have a free hand to bring the manifestation of his man of sin, this personage of the Antichrist, upon this earth. With no hindrance, with no restraint at all. Paul here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 teaches us that after the church is raptured out, Satan will no longer face the restraining power of the church of God, the church of Christ, work, the Holy Spirit working through the church. And even though the mystery of iniquity is already at work, it's present in our day and age right now. That mystery of lawlessness, that mystery of iniquity is still being suppressed. John said this in, in, the, in the book of 1 John. He said in chapter 2, little children, it is the last hour. And as if you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. Who? is a liar. But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming. And even now is at work. Satan, down through church age history, has tried time and a time and time again to bring his man of sin, the Antichrist, on the scene. And every time, God has thwarted that plan through the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. Many Antichrists have come. But one day a day is coming when the Holy Spirit will not work through the church any longer because the church will have been raptured. Satan will be able to bring his man of sin all the way back. The first inkling of a word we have of him is all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 where he's called the seed of the serpent. He's a direct extension of Satan himself who will come to take this earth when the church is raptured out. When all restraint is gone, we'll see that light has departed Darkness will increase in a, in a way that we can't even imagine or fathom. Deception will be the word of the day. Delusion will come. And damnation will follow delusion. Paul teaches us many things here about the end time scenario. He wrote this passage to quell the confusion in the church of Thessalonica. A false letter had been distributed that the day of the Lord, the day of Christ had already come. The day of Christ is a very broad uh, time period. It goes from the rapture of the church all the way to the end of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth after a thousand years. It's a very broad time. And there was a letter being circulated that said the day of Christ had already come. Have you ever, have you ever thought about missing the rapture? When I was in college, I um, came home one Friday. I'd been under conviction for a pretty good while, and uh, I knew I was lost. And I got home. Of course, this was back before cell phones or anything. My mom and dad weren't home. I couldn't find them either. After about three hours, I said, huh? What if I missed the rapture? What if they'd been raptured out? I tried to call my sister and Bob. They lived over in Columbia at the time. Couldn't find them. If 
you ever thought about missing the rapture? No, it, it shook me. It shook me. Well, a letter was being circulated that they had <laughs> missed it. Paul said, look, I don't want you to be soon shaken. I'm going to give you some, some information that you can hold on to. It's not going to change. You know, one of the difficult parts of this, what we're going through in this pandemic, is how everything keeps changing and shifting. What they believed about the virus a few months ago, they don't believe now. And they keep adding and taking away and going backwards and forwards. God's word, God's word is going to stay. It's going to stand. And it's not going to change. We can rely on it. We can live by it. We can put our faith and trust and trust in it, and we can put our eternity in it. Paul says, "The day of the Lord, the day of Christ, can't come unless the falling away comes first." And that has happened. We've already gone through and looked at that. And the man of sin be revealed. Well, he can't be revealed, Paul says, until he who is restraining is taken out of the way. That's the rapture. The man of sin cannot be revealed until the church is raptured out. I don't know how anyone can believe in a mid-tribulation rapture and read this passage of Scripture. The man of sin can't be revealed until he who is restraining is taken out of the way. God is using the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit working through the church to restrain the spirit of Antichrist. Today we're going to look at a world with no restraint. And we see the departure of light. We see the darkness that will increase the deception that will flourish, the delusion that will be sent, and the damnation that will follow. Jesus said to us as the church, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. One day we're going to leave. We're, we're heading out of here. God's not going to leave a few left behind to carry on the work of the gospel. Everyone is going. Every saved person on this planet will leave when Jesus Christ comes in the air. Every saved person. That means darkness envelops this earth. You say, well, wait a minute, Brother Brent. Are you saying that no one will be able to be saved after the church is raptured out? I'm not saying that at all. As a matter of fact, Revelation chapter 7 says that people will be saved out of every, every nation every people every time I have people ask me all the time can people be saved after the church leaves and you know what I've come to understand you know what I've come to realize what they're really wanting to know <laughs> they're really wanting to know what about Those who are left, will there be a chance for salvation? What if I'm left? What, what if I'm left? Do I have a chance to be saved? I'm going to give you clarity of that this morning. I'm going to answer that question for you through the Word of God. You see, There's so many that want to dabble their toe. They want to stay right close to where they think salvation is. They don't want it right now. They don't want that commitment. They don't want to give up control of their life. They just want to stay so close. This old guy right here, I told you a minute ago how I got so scared when I came home to college. I'm gonna find, I've got the Bible somewhere. I had written the plan of salvation in the back of my Bible. And my plan was, <coughs> if I missed the rapture, I would get saved. I'd have to go through the tribulation and I understood how bad that would be and I might even have to be martyred. But 
to be okay and have eternity in heaven. Then I came across 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let's answer that question today. Light has departed at the rapture. Every light. Darkness increases. An absence of light brings an increase of darkness. We're seeing that take place in the world which you and I live as the falling away is coming, as the church, the light of the church is dimming. There's an increase in darkness. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when there's no light left as the church is raptured? Now, we're speaking, of course, of spiritual light and spiritual darkness. With spiritual darkness, no one can see the truth. No one can grasp the truth. God is represented to us as light. God is light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now then, we as the church are to be the light of the world. Satan is represented to us in the world, in the word of God, as darkness. That's why Satan's kingdom is called a kingdom of darkness. It's a kingdom that's not based on truth. It's based on lies. I remember so distinctly after Hurricane Katrina when the lights went out and you'd go into a, 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 a darkened house. How hard it was to see. We were constantly trying to find the light switch to turn the light back on, but it was gone. If you didn't have a flashlight, you was in a heap of trouble. This world's going to be in a heap of trouble when the light leaves. And all saved people are gone. It's a world of no more light, a world of no more salt. I'm not telling you that the Holy Spirit leaves this earth because He doesn't. But He'll no longer be working through the church to restrain the spirit of Antichrist. I don't believe that the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation are simultaneous. I don't believe they happen on the same time. I believe the rapture of the church will take place and there will be a time gap period before the tribulation begins. The man of sin cannot be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. Satan then will be able to bring his man of sin on the scene. And the trigger point for the beginning of the tribulation, of course, is the confirming of the treaty for seven years. That's also described in the final, as the final week of Daniel's great prophecy of the 70 weeks. One seven-year period is remaining. 69 weeks of that great prophecy or 483 years have already come and gone. One week remains and it will be triggered by the beginning of a treaty that the man of sin that we're looking at will confirm for the nation of Israel. It is also in uh, simultaneousness uh, uh, with the opening of the first of the seven seal scroll that you find in Revelation chapter 6 when Jesus opens that first seal and the rider of the white horse comes riding forward. That is the man of sin. That is the Antichrist. That is the man of lawlessness that we're looking at right here. The son of perdition. He's coming. So when the Holy Spirit is no longer restraining the spirit of Antichrist, Satan will be able to bring his man of sin. So I believe there will be a gap between the uh, rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation. I think and I hope that the wars that Ezekiel described in chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel will take place after the church is raptured out, but before the tribulation begins. That war could come before we're raptured up. My hope is it comes after. I think the church leaving with the salt and light being gone, I think the wars of Ezekiel 38 and 39, I think explain the total chaos that this world will be plunged into that will give heed to a meteoric rise of this man of sin that Satan will bring forth from the revived Roman Empire. It will be from this chaos that Satan will bring this man 
to a place of political power and preeminence. He comes riding forth as the rider of the white horse. He's got a bow in his hand. John writes in chapter 6 of Revelation, he has no arrows, so he's conquering this world with peace. He's going to come as an extension of the greatest power ever created. I want you to know Satan is the greatest power that God ever created. He was the head angel of all the angelic realm, and he was perfect till iniquity was found in him. He was the number one angel of all of heaven. And this man of sin, this rider of the white horse, will be a direct extension of Satan himself in the genetic realm. And he will come with all power, signs, and lying wonders. He is going to take this world by storm. He's going to have a solution for every problem. He's going to be able to solve the many crises that no man has been able to solve. He's going to be able to solve the problems of the economies of the world and the ecology of the world. And the first three and a half years of the tribulation will be a time of peace, of false peace, and a great prosperity will flourish upon this earth as he'll be laying his groundwork to conclude completely control this earth not just politically but also religiously because by the midpoint of the tribulation where that groundwork is laid and he will be able to implement what the Bible calls the mark of the beast that no one can buy or sell without taking that mark he will then require the people of this earth to worship him and he will sit in the temple of God showing himself as God to be worshipped as God so we see that darkness that will rise. We also see the deception that will flourish. The departure of light brings an increase of darkness, and then the increase of darkness will bring a deception that will flourish. The Bible says that the one who's coming is according to uh, to Satan, the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deception of wickedness. With all deception, great deception. Now, so you say, what is it to be deceived? It means where you believe a lie. Where you hold on to a lie. You and I have the wonderful promise of discernment. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder to the bone and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You and I can have discernment of what's taking place in the world through the Word of God and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to believe a lie. We have the truth. And we have discernment through the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And you and I, as never before, we need to rely on the discernment that is ours as believers and as, as born-again Christians, as, as, as being uh, led by God's Spirit. We don't have to fall into the trap of Satan and deception. Jesus said that this deception that is coming is going to be so widespread and so rampant that it would almost be the very elect who will be deceived during this time. Can you imagine believing a lie? What if you, believe, what if you were in a mosque somewhere today and you believe that Allah was God and that Muhammad was a prophet? What if you believe that, beloved? What if you bow down to some fat Chinese guy and go Buddha today? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be terrible if you believed that lie? What if you believe Shintoism or Hinduism? What if you believe some of that lie? You don't have to believe a lie. You and I have the truth and the, the Word of God says the truth will make you free. But during this time, after the departure of light and after the increase of darkness in a manifold, uh, exponential way, deception is going to flourish. When the Holy Spirit is no longer working through the church to restrain Satan, deception is going to flourish.
the departure of light leads to darkness that increases, leads to deception. That brings us to the delusion. I want you to read with me. I want you to understand this is straight from the Word of God. Verse 10 says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. That word perish means to die fully. It's the same word that John used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish. Die fully. What does it mean to die fully? To die fully means to experience the second death, which the Bible calls the lake of fire, the place of eternal damnation. So Paul here writes, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, those who die fully, those who experience the second death. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. That they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I want you to understand there's a specific group that receives the delusion, the strong delusion. It doesn't say everyone on the earth will receive delusion. It says those who have rejected the love of the truth. Those who have rejected Jesus Christ are the ones who will be sent this strong delusion. This passage teaches us clearly and pointedly that delusion will be descent, will be sent upon all who have rejected the truth so that they will believe the lie, that they will be damned, that they will die fully. The delusion is sent by God. It doesn't say Satan will bring this delusion. It says God. Have you ever wondered why Satan's going to do it and not God? I mean, God's going to do it and not Satan? He's not going to take a chance and allow one person who has rejected his son in this day of grace to have an opportunity to be saved during the time of judgment after the church is raptured out. If you're listening to me today, either in here in this auditorium, on the radio, or watching a streaming service, and you have a question, can I get saved if I miss the rapture? If you've rejected Jesus after the convicting power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, no. Now John Phillips lays it real clear. This is not this is not a describing a casual or an accidental or a missing out of salvation but it's describing a, relib a deliberate rejection of the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ and he shows us here that this rejection is threefold. First the Bible says here that the heart is involved because they receive not the love of the truth. I want you to know when the convicting power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, He's going to come into your heart, your soul. He's going to bring that conviction right down in here in your soul. Not where you're thinking, but right here. And you're going to make a willful decision to say no. My heart is not open to Jesus to give him control of my life 
I am sitting on the throne of my life. So this first rejection of Jesus Christ is no, you can't have my heart. It's mine. The second part of this rejection comes not only, the first part is the heart, the second part is the brain. Look what it says here. The mind is involved because it is, said, it is stated they believed not. They refused to believe. It's like a hand going up. I don't want to hear it. I don't want any part of it right now. I want to know what's out there and I want to stay close so when I get through living my life the way I want, I can go to heaven and skate right in before I leave this earth and before Jesus Christ comes back. I want you to know you're making a willful decision to stop Jesus Christ coming into your life. And then there's a third part of it. It's the will where it says they had pleasure in unrighteousness. That just simply means they choose the way of unrighteousness over the way of God, the way of righteousness. They choose the broad road instead of the narrow road. They choose what they want to do rather than what God would have them to do. You say, Brent, this is pretty tough talk. Listen to me, we're living in tough times. And we're living in end times, the last hour. Can't you, don't you watch the news sometime and see what's going on in our country and, and say, can't these people see the truth? I'm telling you today, can't you see the truth? I'm not talking about dealing with America going on for a thousand years. I'm asking you, where are you going to be in a thousand years? Because if you mess up in this age of grace and you miss out, I want you to know the Bible is clear. God's Spirit will not always strive with man. And you can't send away your opportunity of salvation. And you can reject Jesus Christ to the point where God's going to send you this delusion so that you will believe the lie. So what's the lie? The lie is that the Antichrist is God. Satan. And God's going to send you this delusion and you're going to be first in line to receive the mark. And you're going to be first in line to do whatever Satan leads to be done during the time period of the tribulation. And you're going to buy into it hook, line, and sinker. And you're going to fall into the category that they all will be face the full death the second death it's appointed unto man wants to die you and I have no choice on that this flesh is going back to the dust of the earth but there's a second death out there that's being described here and this delusion that will be sent on those who reject Jesus Christ right now and they miss that time period, that delusion is strong delusion so that they will believe the lie that they all might be damned because they rejected the love of the truth. Truth is a turn for Jesus. I'm the way the truth is because they rejected the love of Jesus because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And they refuse to believe and commit their heart and life to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to your hand. Father, we're dealing with a very serious passage of Scripture. We're living in very difficult days. We can see your prophetic word unfolding right before our very eyes. We can see all the things that you've taught us about your word happening. Let not one person leave this building today without knowing, without knowing that their salvation is safe and secure in Jesus. For those listening, for those watching, may the convicting power of your Holy Spirit be so strong in their life that they would not be able to turn from so great a salvation that's offered in your Son, Jesus. And for anyone who needs to be saved, may they say this day, 
Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save me. I give you my heart and I give you my life. I give you everything I have. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. invite you to stand. If you gave Jesus your heart, you'll need to come forward and make that public. Jesus never called one person in private. Everyone ever called was called public. We invite you to come. We invite you to come and do what God would have you to do in receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Eric, please lead us. Only trust him. Not every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. you can't feel in your heart what's happening in this world, you get your eyes opened up. Joel's going to come and dismiss us in prayer. And, um, we're going to be around here. If you want to get a matter settled, don't leave. We, we, we'll stay here all afternoon. We, if you would like to call us, please do so. Thank you for being here this morning. May God bless you. Let us pray. Father, we believe your word. Father, our trust is in your word and in you. And our hope is in you. So, Father, if we believe in your word in its entirety, Father, we can't escape the fact that the time is drawing nigh. As one spirit filled man said, hell is going to be full but may they have to move us out of the way and remove our clenches to get there. Father, may your church proclaim the gospel. Father, I pray for those that are struggling this morning. I've been there. Father, I just pray that you'll continue to draw men and women to you. For Father, those that's got the gnawing feeling in your gut, Father, continue to work. Father, on April 2013, I laid down my pride. And never again have I had that feeling. So, Father, we pray for those who's got the feeling just to drop your pride, drop your ego. So, Father, the song says, soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Mm -hmm. so, Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he's done on our behalf. And may we work until the day comes. Father, protect this church. Father, protect its people. And Father, may we be a church of Philippi that we work until the day comes. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. But most importantly, we thank you for Jesus. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Amen.